based on the current nationally determined contributions, the gap to emissions consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 is estimated to be around about 22 gigatons global emissions. Um, global emissions need to peak between 20 and 2025 to limit warming. We see that emissions have peaked in developed, in some developing countries, but not globally. So in order to reduce our emissions, we need to cut them, or to reach these targets, we need to cut by 43% by 2030. And my question is to the panel, is given that past energy transitions, when you think about historically moving from wood fuel to coal, from coal to gas and, and others, these transitions have always taken in the order of decades, 30, 40 decades, to achieve maybe 40, 50% uh, energy change. So how do we get this done? How do we affect this energy transition effectively in a decade that in the past has taken several decades? Um, we said earlier there's no quick answers. So who, who wants to have a go? Steve. I mean, maybe uh, just to kind of frame the kinds of things that we need to do to get onto 1.5 degree pathway just in South Africa. All right. So uh, according to the work the National Business Initiative did on net zero pathways for each sector of the economy, we would need to close all coal by 2040. We would need to uh, have a million electric vehicles on the road by 2030 and an absolute ban in the sale of internal combustion engines by 2035. We would need to shift 30% of people from conventional diets to climate-friendly diets. That means 100 grams of meat a week. Right, these are not small changes. Right, I, I, I joked. Um, I, I made a, a speech at one of the cops. I can't remember which one. That South Africa will give up coal before we give up meat. <laughs> right, and I think that's the challenge we face. These are these are socio-cultural issues, and so I don't think it's a, it's not a technical engineering problem. We have uh, the the engineering solutions we need today to solve for 70% of our emissions today, financially viable solutions today. The problem is we're not implementing them fast enough, and that gets back to these kind of socio-political challenges. And so the, the key in this is, is collective will, and that needs us to really understand the science. And we play into a very complicated space of misinformation and vested interests, both at a sort of national company, global level. And, and those are the things that we have to solve. So I think the solution lies not necessarily in engineering and innovation, which of course is important for the remaining 30%, uh, but in really trying to align on a common set of goals. And of course the global stock take mm -hmm. is kind of what it's about. Uh, but at the moment we conveniently ignore the degree of the challenge. And I, and I think that it's obvious that that change is at, is at community, individual, policy, national, and, in, and global level. It's not a, something we can push out there. At the individual level. Which, you know, we have to accept that the quality of life that we as individuals have, particularly those of us in this room, is way higher than is sustainable, and you need to make some real changes. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in, uh, Thuraya, your, your view on, on, on this energy transition uh, what are your views on, on, on achieving this size or this magnitude of a shift? Thank you very much. Um, I think the concept of having a just energy transition lies in one of the key aspects of the global stock take. And I think it's, um, I think it's something that uh, would definitely have to be welcomed in a nationally determined manner, you know, basically how how different countries can can accelerate a, a just transition within their means and within their ability to um, update and enhance their NDCs. And with that respect, um, I think the global stock take could be a very useful tool for that. And as you were, you know, as you were mentioning, the the technical synthesis report highlights, you know, what what the key gaps are and how we can get there. You know, and, and also echoing the AR6 um, report that, that basically highlights the science, you know, that we are off track and how do we get there. So I think transferring what we have under the technical synthesis report and, and, and really generating key political messages out of that 
and trying to encourage, you know, multilateralism as it's at, at its finest. Um, how can um, we collectively come up with a solution that would welcome uh, increasing our ambition in our NDCs, but in a way that complements uh, different nations in their approach towards climate ambition? Oh, th thank you very much. <clears throat> Guy, I saw you writing notes. <laughs> yes, and your hands up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. It's a, it's a great question. And um, yeah, thanks for all the points uh, expressed so far. I think they're all very, very relevant. Um, I, I just think we need to flip the narrative from challenge to opportunity. Um, once, you, once you shift your mindset into one of an, a, a future which is better for everybody, is more equal, is cleaner, and offers uh, better jobs, uh, better lives for everyone, then it becomes a lot more acceptable and a lot more engaging to envision that future. We, we just, by being stuck in the concept of challenge, and I mean, I appreciate, Steve, it is a challenge, there's no question. But if we, if we keep ourselves stuck in the notion that it is a challenge, then we, we miss the opportunity of, of expressing a vision of a better, of a better future. And that, I think, is, is a really, really important mind shift. And it brings, uh, you know, it brings a much more optimistic view. And you can then infuse and encourage and give people hope. You know, the young generation needs hope, man, desperately. We, they are just, they are bowed under with, you know, the appalling political leadership which has led to all these wars, uh, conflicts. <laughs> we need to offer young people a vision of a future world where the where they have the means uh, of, of, of more engagement with their economies and, and a better chance for all. So that to me is the is the key thing. And Southern Africa is at a point where it is undergoing massive transformation. It's the one of the fastest urbanizing populations on the planet. Our population rate uh, of increases is dropping. We, we, our GDP is rising mostly across the, the region. This is a region which is on the brink of a really strong sustainable growth pathway. And we need to seize this opportunity and not go down the wrong route, the route of fossil fuel dependence for our region and with, and with all the, the conflictual issues that it brings. So that, that would be my advice is really try and flip the narrative. Thanks, Guy. Tanya, what, what does that mean for corporate strategy in the CSR ESG space? Yeah, well, you know, listening to Guy there, usually I'm the one who's, you know, glass half full, um, being positive, always hopeful. But Guy, I'm sorry, when you are facing 10, we need 10 years, even I am struggling to be an optimist because you can on the ground have all the enthusiasm and a shift of mindset, but I've spent the last 15 years trying to shift the mindset of um, business and of board in boardrooms <laughs> and hasn't been easy at all. So now we've got 10 years. And if I think of how, you know, how hard it was then, it's even harder now because now you're actually marrying it down to finance, finance and risk. This is real economy stuff. This is no longer, oh, the greenies. <laughs> I was called one of those greenies for many years. Th that doesn't exist anymore. We need, we need much more deliberate action. And it needs to start at a, at a policy level, at a government level. Um, corporates can put in place, you know, hundreds of KPIs, etc. But we're not going to shift the needle unless we have this um, guidance. And, and I, hate it. I hate to say it, but we need to force companies to take this seriously and to start reporting. They only take things seriously when it becomes regulation and they have to start reporting on it or it hits their share price. Um, so unfortunately for me, I'm a little – I wish I could be the one that's hopeful and positive. Um, I want to be that person, um, but I'm really, really – I'm scared because if we don't start getting um, our policies right and our regulation right um, and our taxonomies right, you know, we've been talking about ISSB and uh, coordinating all these different standards. If we've got 10 years to go, that should be done. That should be finished, done, implemented. 
Um, so I guess, yeah, I'm, for once, I'm a little more pessimistic. <laughs>